A very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the Raza Foundation and the India Habitat Center. We are still delaying it because in India Habitat Center nothing is starts before 7. So it's a 7 p.m. thing. But we are going to uh, see if we can start early because some people are coming, still coming. And there are no seats, so I'll request my younger friends to vacate the seats and sit on the floor because there's a nice fluffy floor and allow the more senior persons to occupy. My dear young people, listen to this. Otherwise, we'll have the how do you say? Command. Because so many people have turned up to show that Gita Kapoor does not need a formal introduction. Uh, all of you have come here because she enjoys a great reputation as an art critic and a curator. She has been, she has held for fellowship at the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla, and Nehru Memorial Museum Library, New Delhi. One of our, actually she was the first art critic to have taken this, the then contemporary artist, as contemporary Indian artist, the book which made a breakthrough in Indian criticism of art. Then when was modernism, essays on contemporary cultural practice in India, and her forthcoming book is Critics Compass Navigating Practices. It is forthcoming from Tulika Books in 2020. And this evening she is going to speak about our modern so Gita Kapoor. embark right away on the paper. It is a long text and it has uh, quite a number of uh, images, but the text itself is long and you'll forgive me, I will read it. This is some. This is a, a handicap that I've not got over. I need to read my text. I hope you'll bear with me. Our moderns. I was not seriously aware of the implications of my choice of the moderns in my first book in 1978, contemporary Indian artists. I was more conscious of the critical discourse of modernism in my second book in 2000. And now, with a better understanding of the by now historicized phenomenon of the modern, which has been critiqued and re-understood, I think I may have a more um, critical entry into the subjects that I have dealt with for long. At a discursive level, this would require me to understand a vast range of issues that I do not pretend and will not suggest that I do fully comprehend, but at least I am aware of this and that annotates my understanding of the moderns. The basis of Gandhi's anti-modernization manifestos, his polemic with Tagore and Nehru, the contestatory position of Ambedkar, it would include then also a critique of the failed presumptions of the Indian Republic on the promise of an egalitarian society and how it is formulated in Dalit forms of resistance and also an acknowledgement of the subaltern critique of a dismantled humanism and its modernity project alongside a critique of classical Marxist thought and the crucial entry of post-colonial politics and discourse. I have no claims to be able to expand my horizon so wide and I approach this historical legacy of modernism as a filtered trope that allows me to rethink its aesthetic in a revisionist mode. Further, insofar as the generation of our post-independence moderns was prominently male, I would have to understand feminist art history in general 
by writing about, and also by specifically by writing about women artists in our own context. Since the 1990s, I have worked equally and perhaps more frequently on women artists and know how to recognize in retrospect male self-regard, the assumptions of authorial command, gestural handling in a definitive style and recognizable signature, as moderns, the constitution of an artist's solitary self is foregrounded in, the modern, in our moderns, as everywhere else in the world. The represented subject is built up from mid-20th century by existentialism, and within that, a layered core of the erotic that subsists in the unconscious. Both allow for some blueberry challenge to the gods, in the privileged role of the male artist. For reasons and I cannot quite explain, I am stirred with the desire to present three texts written over the last ten years on three paintings of our moderns, our male moderns, and face the scrutiny of your gaze on my understanding of their painterly language, their material aesthetics, their inf inf inferable gender attitude, their iconographic range, and their historical positioning, not only of Indian art, but in modernism as such. To give a more immediate context, Yashodhra Dalmia's book remains a major study of the Indian moderns, of the progressive group. More recently, American academics are adding scholarly work to the period of the 1950s and 60s. Meanwhile, our male moderns are, be are being, I believe, manipulated into institutional and commercial circuits. They are packaged and marketed. They are unextravagant, in some cases almost hermit-like hermit -like lives. Their complex selves, their dedication to the act of painting, all this is slurred and traded around, the, uh, un around and under the title Masters. So much of it is auction hagiography, exploring those, exploit, sorry, auction hagiography, exploiting those who are no longer alive and others who are 90 plus. One such <laughs> wonderful artist sitting in the fourth row before us, Krishna Khanna. It is timely in this climate to remember the gravity of their painterly commitments. I will speak about a single painting of Krishan Khanna, Che Dead, painted in 1970. The painting is representational in the historical sense of the term. This contextual ground is saturated with an expressionist gesture, which is conventionally registered as a mark of the author's presence. Here, specifically, presence in the sense of a witness Here, specifically, presence in the sense of a witness to the affect that resonated across the world at the assassination or in 1967 of Ernesto Che Guevara, the Argentinian Cuban revolutionary. Che was, captured. che was captured in the jungles of Bolivia by armed forces of the dictatorial regimes in South America, backed by the USA. He was captured on October 8th, executed on 9th October, and his body was photographed for evidentiary purposes on the 10th of October. Sidespacing the large category of history painting, I recall just a couple of images from the beginning of the modern era recording death as a public act. The witnessing act, once performed by painting, I will just show you two sets of paintings. These are the famous disasters of war etching prints of uh, Goya. The painting, the executioners of um, at the beginning of the 19th, cent 19th century. And I will speak about this in a moment. 
The witnessing act once performed by a painting changes entirely when a photographic document assumes ubiquitous proof value. The painting done after a photograph assumes a reiterative status. There is a relay between the indexical image, the documentary, photo, photo, the documentary photograph, or any photo, <coughs> photograph, where the viewer is implicated as an objective witness, and in subsequent painting based on the photograph, the painter's rendering offers the possibility of shared subjectivity, assimilating the viewer as a participant in the monomic transposition. Subsequent to the advent of photography, the affect conditioned by the paint, once painting is seen to be subsequent to the advent of photography, the affect conditioned by the painter's inevitable anxiety around the act of representation arouses empathy, making the viewer participant reciprocally more vulnerable in the role of witness to the documentary data. In our times, Gerhard Richter has given us a language of representation based on doubt, misapprehension, and denial, using the very photograph that offers indexical veracity. I'm referring here to Gerhard Richter's set of paintings done in 1988 around the <coughs> theme of the death by suicide in 1977 the mem of the members of the Bader Meinhof Red Army faction. These suicides took place in, largely in the prison in which they were lodged. The paintings by Christian the painting by Christian was made, as I said, in 1970 and followed in 1971 by another set of paintings referring in some cases to Cher's death and in other cases to the, uh, to the war, of ba the Bangladesh war, in, which, in the course of which he painted a set of generals sitting around, in, around the table and uh, confabulating violence. The painting by Christian Khanna was made in 1970 after seeing the photograph put up by the Bolivian authorities of Che as corpse. Later, he read the extraordinary text of Che Guevara by John Berger, originally published in 1967, and is in his <coughs> 1969 anthology, which we all read at the time, the moment of Cubism. And the theme continued in the next two years uh, in Christian's painting. The narrative, narrative of Che's murder includes capture, execution, embalmment, burial, display, and cremation. The body was made to countenance human <coughs> abjection. His eyes and mouth are half open, and the olive green bloodshed sodden trousers are undone. Besides proof of death, the intention is to adopt in an exemplary mode. A, a revolutionary hubris is annihilated by historical nemesis. Understanding the narrative, Berger's text, and the official meaning of the photograph, the intention to both testify to Jay's execution to, and to humiliate him in his last appearance, Christian made a precise choice to not restore Jay to heroism but rather to conditions of vulnerability, rendering his abjection sublime. Christian worked with different densities of pigment. The draped body of Che was painted in translucent layers, attenuated whites, maple yellow, and burnt umber. The body was set against looming shadows of the state officers, painted originally in deep indigo blue, now turned by age into a brown black. Che's pale face is painting, painted like a caress. His barely visible hand is disfigured. His free leg and foot swing, of the, swing away from the officer's hold. There is, <coughs> and then there is a surprise. <coughs> Please 
note, um, I want to, for you to note the <coughs> head of the man holding uh, chairs, face and head. There is a hidden, there is hidden in the ensemble a strange presence, a delicate head and hand of a young man who holds up Jay's head. It is this cue that this, it is this, is this a cue that this may be an unidentified mourner? This little detail is Christian's personal con contribution to the narrative. The reference to Christian's the reference in Christian to Christ's crucifixion, the cruelty suffered by his frail body, and the promise of resurrection emanating from that very abjection, this reference is almost inevitable with reference to, to Che Guevara's death image. <coughs> and we have, uh, as, uh, the, 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 as our great heritage, as it were, the world's heritage, the image of dead Christ um, in a way that is probably um, unrelenting and unredeemable in the memory of humanity, so to speak. And I show um, a couple of images uh, of this, this great painting, Holbein's Dead Christ. And Mantegna's extraordinary view of the dead Christ with which Berger, Berger refers to in his text comparing the position and the holding of the, the, the position in which the head is seen with Mantegna's painting of Christ. The photograph suggests that a human, that, uh, the photograph suggests that a human being can be reduced to what Agamben calls <coughs> bare life, a life that can be sacrificed without regard to a death invoking no regret, no ritual of atonement or mourning. But worldwide mourning followed Guerra's death. And among the many offerings to his memory, the act of painting hopes to suggest that they may be they, that they may emerge an aura in death, an aura special to death. I show here a, a most extraordinarily beautiful Pieta image of Krishna, um, and with it another image which he calls the last operation, oh, sorry, the first operation, and uh, but which is very clearly an image of the deposition of Christ and his laid, being laid, up, laid out on the ground with mourners. The third painting is by a Mannerist, Lebrun, and I choose this because of the very strongly, um, with a, a strong um, cross-reference, but also the fact of a Mannerist use of language, which the modernists use at various points of time, <coughs> and Christian among them. Do we discern a faint sentience in the face of the dead of the dead J, death's gaze? In the words of Maurice Branshaw, the death gaze is a metaphys metaphysical proposition. What role may it play in historical memory? John Berger's unforgettable short essay, which I mentioned, Che Guevara, must be read over again for its <coughs> intense effort to find a dense chest art for the individual figure, placing a wager on life within an always contested history. Not an abstract chest art, Berger was always concrete. He addresses himself to the condition of the world as dictated by imperial powers, subjecting swathes of the world, South America, Africa, Asia, to violent exploitation. Berger brings into the essay, dedicated to Che Guevara, Vietnam, the final post in the People's War, where the decision and conclusion to resist coalesced miraculously in that moment of Vietnam's unbelievable victory. Was there in the face and body of Che as corpse a possibility of historical survival? Not as an icon, but as a figure determined to live his life to its inevitable end. Death as a decision, 
acted out, <coughs> acted out in a life dedicated to opposition, opposing the unjust order of the world. In a letter to his parents when he left Cuba, Che Guevara wrote, Now a will power that I have polished with an artist's attention, with an artist's attention, will support my feeble legs and tired out lungs. I will make it. One of our modernists marked this moment for us, Krishan Kanna, an act of representation in humanist, even almost Christian terms. But such is the transition that works, that such is the trans transition that a work of art may permit. Reincarnations of an image of resistance, sacrifice and reborn in the historical imaginary. We can move between Christian's painting of Che Guevara in the year 1967 and to the call of the present, the unjust and violent regimes that we are witness to, perhaps succumbing to. I end on a gentler note. I end with a few images of Che in India in 1959. Castro and Che saw India as a friend. Very soon after the success of the revolution in 1959, Che, a close comrade of Castro, was sent to, sent to travel in certain parts of the world, which included Africa, India, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Che, che in India, today, Modi hails the Prime Minister of Israel and embraces Trump. The next painting I consider in this talk is Akbar Padamsi's Jew, made in 1960. And by some fortuitous uh, 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 accident, I found that I wish to talk of three paintings, one painted in 1970, one in 1960, and you will see one in 1950. Akbar Padamsi's Juhu, 1960, offers a leap into madness. It is an odd painting that should be in all accounts, which should in all accounts fail. So awkward are its proportions, scale, structure, and surface. So illogical its figural dis deployment, belonging to what has come to be known as Akbar's grey phase, Juhu disrupts the earth of the most rational of artists with singular impunity. The grey phase, around 1958 to 62, is characterized by figuration based primarily but not solely on the female nude. <coughs> The model is a particular woman, woman in most cases. Most frequently, the artist's wife, Solange, a French doctor with a liminal presence, whose vulnerable body is exposed to the gaze and touch of the artist, but tenderly, so that it is del delivered to public viewing with the integrity of presence and a protocol of relationship. I mean integrity not in an ethical, but in a formal sense and protocol is a kind of sacred encounter in that it relies on a frontal address, a mutuality of regard and compassion. The rich grays are obtained from ink and watercolor or suites of plastic emulsion as required by the chosen surface of paper, canvas or board. In each case, the tentative but <coughs> repeated gesture of delineation, brushwork, rubbing and erasure invites sensuous pro proximity. The sense of touch <coughs> mediated by the artist's hand exceeds and dissolves optical curiosity and, so, and also absolves the viewer of fetishist desire. This can be retrospectively came, claimed on Akbar's behalf, considering that the conflict of the male gaze and the female body began, began to be dissected much later in the 70s. While in consequence many great painters have been critiqued, including the brilliantly provocative Souza, Akbar as a painter almost as if redeems himself by a form of de-skilling, by his unwillingness or inability to be a virtuoso draftsman. Or is it perhaps something more? 
he makes the image both tender and strange by cultivating a condition of desire in the default mode, like a bodily given that need not be foregrounded and never dramatized. And just to make this point, I flipped through a few images of Picasso and Matisse. Let me just go back for a minute. <coughs> and you will see what the reclining nude is what we inherited in our uh, 20th century modernism. And uh, this has been both, of course, celebrated and critiqued and uh, analyzed and continues to be done, done to this day. And I want you then to look again and uh, look again at the nudes, uh, the, the green nudes of Akbar. Juhu is, in a sense, the apotheosis of this grey phase. Using a quick, dry, Juhu is, in a sense, the apotheosis of this grey phase. Using a quick, dry, quick, dry plastic emulsion. Can we just go back? To the okay. Can we Using a quick drying plastic emulsion to execute this 20 foot long painting, Akbar brushes a rudimentary schema on the canvas and proceeds to paint the motif with large house painter's brushes. Tins of emulsion in which the artist has mixed white and black into a range of greys. <coughs> Each grey is prepared with reference to a chosen color, say cadmium red, Prussian blue, a particular yellow. This is Akbar's claimed uh, process and a complete eccentricity. The grey is therefore relational. These prepared greys are then labelled with the name of the colour each has been matched to. So that when he puts down the grey on the canvas, he is as if painting in colour. The artist processes the rainbow in a rotor, deriving a subtly gleaming non-colour, replete with met metaphoric resonance. Indeed, of course, application of grey rests with the overall sensation of a moon shadow. This, spe this spectrum holds the secret. Juhu then is and isn't a monochromatic painting. I just wish to make a very quick reference to another artist. I look through, try to remember, scan through a lot of imagery uh, of 20th century art prior to and contemporary to Akbar, and I was surprised not to be able to find a valid equivalent in the way that he, you, that he in the way that he not in the only in the way he paints, but particularly in the way he paints the nude. And what I did find in terms of purely uh, structural um, and uh, structural and surface terms was a pa uh, the paintings of a great painter, Leon Goller, an American painter, with a totally different uh, calling in terms of historical subject matter, but whose work has a strange, uh, strange somnolence in, at certain moments, and particularly interestingly at the moment with around 60, 1960, 62, when Akbar uh, 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 was painting his great paintings. And I just show them as a counter-reference without necessarily uh, relating them directly or making any uh, major point. Agba's rough and vigorous brushwork structures the painting. The very mark of the ha hard, flat brush counts for a discrete unit of construction. He thins the water-based paint and builds a layered surface of grey ranging from opaque to transla translucent. At other times, he leaves the brushed grey dry so as to make the surface threadbare. The cross, <coughs> the figural disposition of the motif suggests that the painting is stratified and stra stacked diptych, joining two narrow compositions. The painting unravels its clumsy part to whole relationship to become an emphatically horizontal frieze. On the left side of the diptych, you see the disappearing edge of a cityscape. A long, jagged joinery of dark earth and illumined sky. 
The cityscape, a fragment out of Akbar's other monumental painting, Greek landscape of the same period. It is made up of cubes, co cones, and triangles in an almost textbook translation of Cezanne's dictum. A spiky, and in Juhu, to return to Juhu, a spiky broad-leaved plant reaches up to the shack cluster above. The stalks and stub form a screen and obscure the relational logic between the forms in nature and human habitat. However, the middle ground unravels along the right side of the painting, and here the artist lays out a giant nude across the suggested beach. The figure lies neither on her back nor on her side, but in a kind of front profile. Her legs are unsheathed, revealing a black triangular potendum. Yeah. One leg is outstretched. Of the other, you see a wasted thigh truncated by, a low, by the lower edge of the picture surface. Sorry, the picture frame. The figure has a sanguine face. The head rests on her bent arm. She has flat, moon-like breasts. Sleeping, dreaming, she suspended against a harsh, hilly ground. She could easily tilt out of the picture. The picture plane, despite its landscape format, does not hold the body in place. Even as the prone figure retracts, <coughs> her wild companion sits bolt upright. She holds her legs apart and exposes a thatched abdomen. She has the appearance of a survivor. She has pushed herself up into the <coughs> foreground, making the prone partner all the more akin to a beached mammal, slipping into a past age and premature <coughs> burial. As the upright sentinel pushes the hallucinated motif into the streets of dire fantasy, the artist skews the proportions, perspective, sky, and the perspective scale of the painting to a crazy edge. This is a painting of the aftermath. For although Akbar was never topical and by no means political, he lived after all in post-war Europe, in Paris, <coughs> strangled by its recent past. And when he met Giacometti, the artist he most admired, he was told in cryptic terms by Giacometti to be interested not in art but in life. So at the same time as there is an end, there is a beginning in Juhu. Ash embalmed bodies in the sunless chill, nature in a state of cold combustion. Akbar, Akbar creates an unholy space. Sorry, Akbar creates an unhomely space. Yet Juhu is a site of survival such as you will find in surreal narratives of lost time, in art, in film, in literature. Through painterly means, the artist embraces the erotic and the absurdly mortal, two aspects of desire that bring art and life to the brink of the sublime. There he stops short in favor of a materialist existential now, confirming the extent to which he is indeed a legacy of mid-century modernism, of the modernist quest for meaning within the dystopian present. Akbar creates in Juhu a ground shift so radical as to make the otherwise standard motif of two nudes at a beach a seismic spectacle. The disproportionate forms produce spatial disorientation. Each submotif is independently not relationally scaled, and there is no common index, or there are several indices. While the declining nude indicates a middle ground, the seated figure is precipitous and the horizon escapes the viewer's optical range, so high is it placed on the picture plane. Juhu is as much a deconstructive exercise as it is a paradigmatic painting. The artist propagates a geometric schema, proxying for a classicizing principle, yet he disavows the frame and the formal protocol of easel painting. The frontality of the image and its unnatural elongation creates not only the equivalent of a cine cinemascope effect, there is a formatting distortion. This syntac syntactical disalignment suggests that the rules of the game in painting, taken as language, are most discernible when they are disturbed, 
and repurposed. Agba, an exemplary modernist, remains non-canonical and even anomalous. What is most important, therefore, is the conceptual paradox. Akbar's insistence on the rationality of the hidden schema produces an almost opposite effect. The painting expands into a phenomenological field within which we discover perceptual proximity between our bodies and those inhabiting the artist's imaginary bodies in wilderness. Such an encounter finds even the skeptical viewer succumbing to the folly and jouissance of the uncanny. The contradictory delay reaches a logical as much as a painterly threshold. Akbar, with a pristine sense of self, there are, develops a fuzzy logic, a category of thought that prevents the more deterministic aspects of geometry, aesthetics, and philosophy to take hold of the image that allows, moreover, those ambiguous forms of knowledge, the hermeneutically excavated residue, the hermeneutically excavated residue of doubt and desire to survive. The third painting that I consider is Hussein's Man, circa 1950. I might mention that today is Hussein's birthday, and we should celebrate Hussein today with this extraordinary painting that he painted almost at the very beginning of his artistic career. How do modernist myths that are fiction about modernism, as well as iconography shape, shaped by modernity, develop in different cultures? My double allegory based on Hussein's very early, wholly unexplained, and in some senses unsurpassed painting, Man, may open this out. The painting is horizontal, mural-sized, and monumental, and works on the structural principle of a triptych each roughly equal panel holding a prime motif with several figural accretions clustered around it. The visual impact of the painting precedes a reading of its iconography. Structured with black that serves as figure and ground, the picture surface is flagged by broad swathes of crimson, olive green, a range of ochres and white, rich and vivid hues that gave Hussein his reputation of being a distinctly Indian colorist. The surface seems at first to mimic a wall painting in the way the line, a white incision, contours the tumbling forms across the surface of the wall canvas and even in the way the rich hued pigment is applied as though smeared, dabbed and squelched with fingers and palm. But there is also a strange fragility about the surface. And on second take, one might read the painting as a giant size collage fra fabricated from colored kite paper used for tasyas and the Dundur horse, carried processionally at Muharram, the love of which initiated Hussein as a boy into art making. The joinery at the seams of the cut out figures resembles this, the rough stitching of a tailor's white thread so that the composite image <laughs> So that the composite image becomes a paste and stitch collage. Man is the first sample of the virtuos, virtuoso in Hussein. Next. But the virtuosity carries the poignancy of an explorative, craftsman-like language, seeking a hand that will acquire and later perhaps squander the, the gift of a great drafting talent. You have on the screen, just as cross-reference to a, a painting's very close in date, uh, Zameen. There's the full panel and a detail on top, and a painting called Indian Village below. Man is emphatically modernist and based on an understanding of the Cubist language. Placed at the fulcrum of modernism, Cubism provided the grammar as well as the vocabulary in use throughout the 20th century and all over the world. Its broader application permitted the opening up of a syntactical opening up of syntactical rules beyond the analytical and classical phase of Cubism and supported quite unexpected ends. Once the fovist expressionist impulse was assimilated, 
There was a more gestural rendering of the contour, the pa pa palette glowed, and the gestalt, gestalt approximated psychic states of the mind. I project here a, a, a double image. One is the uh, image of uh, Rampinga Beji's Birth of Krishna, also painted in 1950. And a most unexpected and uh, uh, unexpected collage made by Vivan on a large scale, where he collaged uh, the painting of uh, Rampinga Bej and uh, the Krish birth of Krishna and Hussein's uh, man in a way that you find uh, an amazing ability, uh, an amazing outcome of, uh, of integration and energy which the two paintings together and the two artists together in 1950 were able to um, to, to release, and in which more than in the actual separate paintings, the principle of cubist collage becomes foregrounded. There was also uh, there, <coughs> to move on then from this this image. There was also a substantial humus, <coughs> humanist, even propagandist thematization possible in the this mid-20th century period, such that Picasso, using the structural potential of cubism, demonstrated, had demonstrated earlier in Guernica. Hussein intuitively understood what modernism's grammar could do for him at the head of his artistic journey. And with man, he grasped that potential to construct a complex thematic, yet withhold its narrative to provide an ambiguous gestalt of meaning that shifts in and out of the grid and destabilizes the picture of the world, making the very risk of falling apart correspond to a universal humanist call for survival. A stark black figure is majestically enthroned in the center of the painting. His profile studied with a green eye that looks omniscient even, at a, even as his nude body <coughs> sitting on a peely throne, roughly painted crimson, mimics the gesture of the thinker. The man, savage, in quotes, and superhuman, demonic and wise, is accompanied by an upturned, more ethnicized double on the left, on the left of the painting. This figure in dull ochre with large head and blind eye, checkered garment and upswung foot, takes a fall, his skull docketing into the humped back of a black bull. An archaic symbol spanning Indic iconography from Mahajadaro to Shiva's Nandi. And indeed, the central figure, black and phallic, could be the primordial Shiva himself. Two earth-colored tablets engraved with <coughs> two torsos each are propped up on the either side of the central figure. Learn, learning Takhti, spelling out Hussein's figural alphabet for his indigenous typology to come. On the extreme right, <coughs> symmetrical to the fallen man on the left, looms a dressed up goddess, a goddess figure in the shape of a giant effigy, holding up a large white hand that has symbolic as well as choreographic value in that, in that it is one of the three alliterative hands sequenced across the painting. Just as each large figure gestures with a single hand, there's a play of feet, large footprints on the picture surface that serve an indexical, a kind of evidentiary purpose in the otherwise opaque allegory of, a de of degrounded bodies. In the painting's boldly laid out gestalt <coughs> is embedded a half-clad midget, bent and balancing on a single foot. It's not immediately visible, and when I was scrutinizing the painting, I was surprised and delighted to see that green figure, which is schematically uh, introduced and remains liminal, but in some ways has a connection with all three figures. A half-clad midget bent and balancing on a single foot. The most ambiguous character in this frieze of figures, 
it could be a puppeteer or the puppet, an itinerant, itinerant spy or the proverbial clown in every epic. He could be Hussein's talisman, a fetish against fate. Whether this painting is fresco or collage, archaic or ephemeral, Hussein astutely prefigures these modalities and set, sets up the parameters for his future work. And uh, whether man is chanced upon in a cave or carried like a banner in a pageant, for as I mentioned, the painting allows you to switch surface and frame. <coughs> the motif is tantalizing to this day. I am not sure if man's structural and existential rendering should be read in historical relation to the just preceded Holocaust of the subcontinent's <coughs> partition, or indeed the birth of the Indian Republic. But I am recklessly lured into drawing from it a pictorial allegory matching Hussein's present position, or when he, I wrote it, his present position, his last years. <coughs> in a violently divided world, risking an anachronistic reading the, of the artist's uncanny vision of the future, I propose that man allegorizes a theme more epic than any of his other works, dealing demonstrably with epics and myths, civilization and history. It offers from within the very paradigm of, of what I called modernist myths, the paradox of Hussein's own upturned life. Replete with civilizational symbols, bewitched by the hand of fate, the split and doubled artist, or, uh, split and doubled artist ponders and meditates and gestures, rendering performative to the powers of the meta mind, apoptic energies that unfold in multiple registers, in great cycles, shot through with dialectically determined history, which we can re read now back into the 20th century. Thank you. My friends, you will agree that this was a brilliant analysis of three major works of three major moderns. Normally, the memorial lectures are not followed by questions and answers. The memorial lecture finishes. But should there be some people who are bubbling with some sharp questions and could we possibly provoke some discussion? We have some time. Please raise your hand. The mic shall come to you. Just a minute. But raise your hand nonetheless. Well, while people are making up their minds what to ask, uh, may I tell you what we are going to do next? <laughs> uh, we have the Kesar Mahapatra Memorial Lecture on 31st October to be delivered by Sadanand Menon, and the title will be Dancing Democracy. So you are most welcome, and I must clarify that Nothing in Habitat Center starts before 7. And when we say 6.30 in our invites, that means you come at 6.30, have some tea and coffee, and since you must have walked, I mean, I mean come from a long distance, feel a little relaxed so that you then receive some wisdom later. So it is not our fault that we delayed. <laughs> It is because this is the convention here. We are instituting from next year the Raza lecture. And the first lecture in a kind of a series of three lectures will be by Professor Homi Bhabha. And this will be on 17th and 18th of January. So if you want to record it, please. We have on the 19th September, that is day after, 
at the India International Center Multipurpose Hall, a series which we have been running called Gandhi Matters. And since it has evoked a very good response and a lot of interest, we have now extended it by another year, to which IIC helpfully agreed. So on the 19th September, we have three artists, just as one of the moderns is present out of the three discussed today, one of the artists, Gulam Muhammad Sheikh, is present, and we have the other two artists, um, Atul Dodia and Vyas Kong. All the three have used Gandhi motives and Gandhi vision and Gandhi's uh, not necessarily figure but ideas in their art. So they will be talking and presenting their works. So you are most welcome to come there. And we are doing in Raipur on 21st and 22nd a two day thing on Srikant Varma called Isra Rasta. Uh, he had a poem which says, Isra Rasta bhi hai, but na to wo avanti ho kar jata hai, aur na hi magad ho kar. So we are talking about the third. Uh, now, in the meantime, has somebody come up with a question? <laughs> I was trying to, ah, yeah, there it is. And please do utter your name, because we are recording. Thank you. Uh, yes. My name is Parivartan. Uh, I'm a visual artist. Your name is Parivartan? <laughs> what a name. So, I, I like to talk so much because I have again started painting, so it was very interesting to uh, hear someone talking at this moment about paintings. And all. My question is about when uh, you discuss this three painting with three modern artists, you sold this oh, uh, Western painters, uh, um, Picasso, or uh, all the Matisse and all these yeah. as references. Yes. So, and, and while you discuss those uh, Western artists, you use the word like legacy, heritage, and inheritance, uh, like world culture. So, I, I'm wondering, are these words, legacy, heritage, and inheritance, are these sufficient to sufficient? to justify the influence or uh, imitation in the modern uh, modern time? This is a question which normally a foreigner would ask. <laughs> this is a question which when I give any, any of us give talks abroad, we are asked about uh, influence and derivation and uh, imitation. I wouldn't expect for us to ask this question of ourselves. I feel completely easy and confident of making what references I wish. If I'm making a point about the nude, I could have shown Souza. I wanted to make a point about the mid 20th century conventions of the nude within within Western art, within any art. I, it would be the easiest thing for me to take a Souza, for instance and make a comparison. And that I would expect to be so familiar to our uh, imagination that it would not necessarily make a point, or it would make a point, but I choose at any given point to make cross-references as I like. And I absolutely do not any longer subscribe to, bow to, or uh, worry about where that the modernist lineage belongs to everyone in the world as to our own cultural heritage and our indigenous forms. And so the two are at given points that you will find many of my essays referring more to one and more to the other. And this, I believe, is uh, one's uh, critic's choice at a given point of time, within a given thematic and a given argument. If you were read, to read some of my other essays at the moment, uh, written in the past 10 years, you will find exactly what you're asking for that there is a questioning, a critique, a challenge, a provocation to the Western tradition. But allow me at a different point to make my references as I choose. I see no other hand. Oh, there it is. <coughs> Maybe 
der Fred am Gita kaputt hat. But maybe it's a question which is related with Paribhatan's question, but from a different angle. You know, your own frame is uh, seem to be a modernist frame of compatibilism. But within that, there is a certain uh, temporal uh, frame which also, some I think, underpins your choice of uh, artist. <laughs> For example, Albert Padamsi's comparison with Leo, Leo Kolo was, um, of course, formalistic. At the same time, there was a certain kind of a temporal, logic of temporality. To what extent that frame is important for you? Can you just, I think I got it, but I'd like you to just be a little bit, uh, explain this a little bit more. It says that uh, the kind of compatibilism, this frame of comparison that you open up, it's, it can extend anywhere. So, I know that your choice is not arbitrary. There is certain logic which guides your selection of artists. Uh, even, even to reflect on omission as to when you look at uh, Padamsi's work and you are not able to find an ex kind of a corresponding artist within the Western context. So the that absence becomes an important critical aspect. Within the Indian as well. Yeah. I could not. I would not show. It would have made no purpose for me to show Suza's new in this case. It would have only been a provocation. So what I'm trying to say is that this is not to establish some singular originality. It is to wonder at certain kind of formal choices at a certain period. And the only only one reason of choosing Golub, I, I debated with myself whether I should or not, because Golub is not in the same idiom in the historical mode or he's, he's a historically informed, politically active artist, which Akbar was not. So I only, because my analysis is you, uh, my interpretation analysis today, which is not always the case, but today, was so obviously formalist. And I was very clearly making a formalist argument as much as I was making an argument for a certain kind of represent, representational practice at three historical points withinism. So there were two aspects. There were tempor temporality, I think, was related to the Indian uh, context. And the formalism was related to languages across at any given point of time. Now, Golub only made sense really rather uh, briefly because of a certain use of a surface and impasto of a certain kind, which accreted on the canvas, which accreted an image on the canvas rather than uh, delineated it. And it was interesting for me just the fact that both those images were of men. These are monumental men. And uh, in one sense, Golub's subject matter has very often been male conflict and very often uh, aggressive aggression within the social order, aggression of the white over the black. And, Etc. So I was interested in the fact that the, that the male figures, so monumental, could be placed for a moment, just for a moment, with uh, the representation of the female body by Akbar, but no more than that. And the Matisse and Picasso, you understood why I was bringing them in, because there's a convention of the line nude, which we have all, in some ways, has as part of our art historical and aesthetic um, uh, vocabulary, and you suddenly you put them there with the Akbar's painting, and you're surprised at the, at the severity of Akbar's news. So I was making a point at, at basically at formal levels, but choosing the temporal frame, I think, for our own understanding of our own context and our own modernism. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Gita. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about the first painting, uh, Che Guevara painting, Christian Kanna's painting. You begin to hint at it, but I'd like you to speak a little bit about the importance of Christ as a figure, especially the death of Christ, 
and the multiple histories of how that representation, for example, a painting which you didn't talk about, Jacques Louis David's Death of Marat. I had it, I took, out, took it out at the last moment for reasons of, well, well quite incidental reasons. Yeah. I had it in my PowerPoint. So I, I wanted to ask you to talk about that because Badamsi does this. Uh, and of course, Sousa does it a lot. What? Uh, uh, this painting of Christ's end, huh. right? Asatish Gujral, quite often. And it's a particular kind of male Indian modernist engagement with Christ's end. Uh, and the status of the artist at a particular moment, which I think is really important, and I'd really love to hear it, especially because you said there's a hagiography developing around the auction culture, which forgets that moment when Christ represented a real pain or a real anxiety in Indian modernism around partition just in the years before and in the, let's say, the 15 years after. Thank you. Yeah. Um. I think that the representation of Christ is the most, uh, uh, the wound of Christ is the most felt and expressed by Sousa. And not surprisingly, he's a born Christian, he is uh, a rebel within Christianity, but refers again and again to the wounding. And the wounding is self-wounding, it is a sadistic wounding, it is masochistic wounding. And he does this both as a social, um, a social sign, but also as an autobiographical sign. So Sousa is actually totally um, in, invested in that image. I think that when it is otherwise um, the early modernists, the, the post-independence modernists use uh, the Christ image um, with a degree of, uh, Ara uses it strangely, and uh, with a degree of, uh, for its allegorical purposes, not for its subjectivist uh, 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 impact. And I think that when Christian uses it, he uses it very strongly allegorically in the large number of Christ paintings that he had done. Probably as many and more as Sousa would have done over a long period of time. But very soon, um, Christian started embedding them within a social fabric which was around him. So he made it a societal, a contemporary societal context in which you recognize the Christ figure or may not recognize him. It was not so uh, crucial. It was certain moments in Christ's life which could allegorize different aspects of the social that he was investigating. I think the Pieta that I showed is, is of a different order. And I think, I think that Pieta has a quality of pain and a delineation, a mannerist delineation, which equals some of the paintings that would be actually done by a Christian believer. So there is, that I think is an extraordinary shift uh, in the otherwise more socially allegorized representation of Christ. And um, I brought that painting to mind here because obviously I was bringing uh, the question of sacrifice of, well, to be more precise in terms of how I put it, of bare life, of a human being reduced to, in Agamben's terms, bare life, but being thereby also potentially a, a figure to be resurrected. So I think I was interested in that particular painting of Christian's theater for that reason. Yeah. I don't have a question. <laughs> you have the answer? No. <laughs> Just to think aloud. <clears throat> the choice of three intrigued me, and I'm still intrigued by that choice. It must have been a hard choice. I can imagine. But thinking it in terms of how the three fit into one single scheme or a frame, you chose Kishan and you focused on some kind of a politics. Such, I would say, what shall I say, centrality of politics. In a sense, you also brought images which were close to political discourse. 
you chose an Akbar which appeared to be flip side. In say the that, sense say that, that say flip that, side. Say that again. You chose Akbar in the sense that it is a flip side. It's not opposite. Yeah, yeah. But then there is something political about it, which means that there are city groups, you know, of the kind in which, you know, the early sixties particularly, you know, was occupied with. I'm using this word city blues particularly in many senses, you know, in terms of music, in terms of literature, in terms of various other things. Hussein knew somewhere put on the sort of a, I don't know where, either in the middle or somewhere, where the human condition in a sense brought all the three together. It was Hussein, the example of Hussein, in a sense brought both Kishan and Akbar together. And I was quite intrigued by that you managed to do that, which is, I think, quite a challenge. And just Thank you. I must say that I did not, I have to confess that I, I saw them as fairly discreet, but uh, uh, where one, the uh, Krishan as a, in, his, in this particular choice of the painting, clearly political, but within a humanist frame. I know the humanist frame is deeply critiqued today, but I would like to insist that that painting is done in a humanist frame, and that we can re that there is re there are reasons to rethink the human humanist frame at various points in our human history, and so. Uh, that, that was my interest. It was political, but also the human, humanist frame, and, and within that, a Christian tradition. Uh, but, uh, and I think you're very right about Akbar. It is a painting of and about alienation. Alienation. And I, alienation. And I think that the 1960s could be, I hadn't figured that, but it could be uh, 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 questioned on, or, spoken of in that mode or interpreted in that mode. I must, must say that I did not realize that Hussein brought these together. But what I think Hussein's man does is to become so deeply historically grounded in that moment that perhaps that is in some senses a little bit related also to what Morrell asked about the temporality. I think that historical moment and that historical image that he was able to create is, um, take, now that you put it like that, takes both the existential and the political within its fold. So I haven't thought of it like that, but I'm grateful. But there is another aspect, since you mentioned formalism, the formal aspects. I felt that in the case of Kishan, it's a purely formed language. That at point of time in the history of the progressive models, you know, the 70s is a period when you find that fully sort of realized. Same is the case with Akbar a little earlier, although he is struggling. You know, he is between some kind of an area which is unknown. And perhaps he begins somewhere and ends somewhere else. Yeah. But in the process, he comes to formulating something which was going to be sort of going to, well, it was going to realize in his work, you know, in terms of a kind of fully formed language. I find that Hussein is in the process of forming the language. Yes, indeed. You see, it is yes. not the formed language. So in a way it is very interesting that it is it comes at the cusp of the independence. And yes. that is something which is political. Yes. That's the language, language is being now a, a, a tool, not a tool, but a, a weapon. You know, in some way, or both ways, both tool as well as a weapon, in which you are exploring the human condition. I use the word human condition again and again, because I think that is what brings them together. Yes. And I think it is in that sense that I thought that even in formal terms, the three of them can be seen, you know, in a kind of a different kind of a time. Anyway, I just want to uh, talk about the Hussein painting, for instance. 
And he stayed, I stayed with it for over two years. And I'm just giving you a short history of this thing and then to talk about it later. But the um, painting was with me for over two years and then there was a, a common friend who was wanting to buy it and uh, Lance Dane, in fact. But Lance Dane was a very nice chap, a bit dicky, you know. I mean, slightly, slightly, um, Unreliable, say it says rather strong word, but uh, so uh, Hussein was uh, going abroad at that time and he said he was needing money and so forth. So Lance, we met at my house and Lance said to him, well, I've got this friend of mine who's a famous atomic scientist in London and why don't you go and meet him and uh, I'll write to him and he'll give you the money. And the money was only a hundred pounds incidentally for the spending. So I said, I said to Hussein, I said, okay, we do this, you write to me when you receive the money, and then I'll release the painting. <laughs> well, that never happened. <laughs> so, I, 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 so the painting stayed with me. The other point is that Rudy Lyman, who was very central to our situation in Bombay, that's it. He was bowled over by this painting and he, he in fact delivered a, a, a very long speech lecture uh, on All India Radio at that time. And I seem to remember parts of it, etc., which have been enunciated today and said. But I mean, uh, it, it carried, uh, it carried uh, shall we say, uh, uh, an importance from the very moment that it was done. People came and saw it, they were bewildered by it, they were for, for, and it's the same reaction which is happening even now. I mean, it dodges you, you can't put your finger on it completely on one particular thing. It's, it's saying a massive number of things actually. And the interesting thing is, I think, is about this painting that its size is very important because it manages to hold in its composition, which is a very complicated composition, everything together, all the different points which happen, which buried us politically as well as economically as well as formally. And they can congeal. This happens very rarely in art actually, but it happened there. And um, I, 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 it still remains, I think, one of his most memorable paintings. Uh, can I dare to use the word epic that connects these three different works? And can I ask, and I think he's here, my friend Kumar Shani, who is very articulate about this concept and is engaged with it, and also with the artist in particular, Thank you very Akbar Matamsi. Why were you keeping quiet? Uh, you know, it's a remarkable experience too. Uh, and I'd uh, not expected such a marvelous uh, reintroduction to paintings that I know already. Uh, and it's the, I think what unifies these very discreet kind of traditions as well as, uh, you know, what you talked about the inheritance that we have with, and discrete personalities and their approaches to, um, to our society and our, our political economy. And the, it's, it's the ease with which she was able to work through from formal aspects to the language that was being created by the, by the modernists. You know, which which is a great and really laudatory struggle. Uh, you know, after independence, we had we had to reconstruct 
every, every form of language. And I consider painting also something which is certainly not a purely decorative act. You know, it, it is not an act of design. It is an act where it absorbs so many different traditions and then brings to it a new set of meanings which activates you into real, real everyday situation, meeting everyday situations in a political way, one way or another. You know, I believe even Montreal was doing that. So it's not surprising that a painter like Art Per, whose main concerns always seem to be uh, formal, is also a historical creature that he he may not intend it, in, intend his brush stroke to be historical, but it is, you know. And this this is the basis of uh, all the relations, uh, all the dialogues that we have had at his workshop, for example, in Bombay. And uh, Christian used to drop in there as well. Uh, I remember uh, when, whenever we talked about it, I used to tell him, oh, you, anarchist, you know, you only think of that gesture of your brush uh, and not of anything else. But that gesture had such a fundamental, you know, attachment to freedom. And that, that's what all of it is talking about. And thank you very much, Gita, for so uh, happily moving from the historical to the formal to everything else. Not many of us have that facility. Thank you very much. Okay, should I go first? And this will be the last question. No, 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 no. If there are more questions, we'll take it. No, okay. Yeah, they are. Thank you so much. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed your lecture. It was absolutely wonderful. Just one observation because I am um, an associate professor of English literature, very much interested in visual arts. So I was just comparing the modernist uh, modernism as we have, you know, as we are teaching it, and uh, what you were saying about formalism and humanism and uh, trying to go back and thinking that it is not to be discredited as it was once discredited. So perhaps looking at the political uh, climate of today and moving from modernism to perhaps Foucault and to uh, clear enunciation, discuss uh, enunciation of uh, resistance to a kind of a world, and uh, you know, world political climate where we need to go back in order to make a political statement back to humanism and back to a formalist way of uh, enunciation in order to, you know, um, sort of subtly hint or point towards what we are trying to say. Uh, what would be your take on that, if you've understood <laughs> what I'm trying to say? No, I just would like to say that whereas I did use the word humanist, I know the critique of humanism. I also know, have in many ways subscribed to it uh, and know the theoretical discursive um, dismantling of the idea of humanism as indeed also of contingent modernisms. And so it cannot be a very um, simple ground anymore. And if I then over and above treading, treading this critically uh, annotated uh, terminology, if I also then foreground, as I've done here and in some re other recent long essays of mine, uh, form formalist understanding of language, understanding of language in very strictly formalist terms as well, then uh, I am in one sense uh, raising the question of where my political will be situated an older vocabulary of the humanist and the representational and uh, a very uh, highly specialized and, and remote vocabulary of formalism, then what would be the means by which I would negotiate this into any understanding of the political of today? And I pose that as a question to myself and I struggle it, with it in my writing. I wouldn't have an answer. Yeah, um, yes. Yeah, 
question. Okay. No, it's not a question exactly, but uh, more of a was trying to hearing you. I was trying to think with the structure of your talk today, uh, which in a way kind of a reclaiming or a personal beholding of the moderns, which comes across from your title and the and the three paintings that you selected uh, have a certain kind of a movement from Che Det to reclining nude to uh, uh, to this third one, the man, uh, which again from 70s to 60s to 1950s, so it's like a descendant, uh, a kind of a dissension. Uh, it made me immediately think of uh, two or three movements, uh, particularly the, the free fall the free fall of the reclining nude. So when I, I mean, the gray nude of uh, Akbar Padamsi that you showed, uh, which is also part of the museum collection, okay, KNMA collection. Uh, for me, some, I mean, more than often, like it's, it's, it's where the free fall has ended. Like, so the Jew comes maybe before that or after that, I don't remember exactly the dates, but I uh, think it's a little after. after. A little after. The but within the year. And it's from the same phase, the gray, uh, the gray phase, the gray nude. And, so, so the free fall of the reclining nude to to that to the gray this particular painting where the uh, where the it has it has landed and and there seems to be a, a uh, I mean a, a coming to terms with the, uh, with, with the with the formalist with the formalism of, of that vocabulary and also you know so so what I'm trying to trace is a little you know there is it comes to an upright man man sitting up and to to a certain kind of an emission of light. It immediately made me think of the lantern in the first operation, to the lantern in the spider and the lamp, and to the holding of the lantern as a as a motive that keeps coming across in this uh, in the repertoire of uh, or, or of, of symbolism. So, so, so the particular kind of uh, quality of light that is emitted seems to be emitting like in Krishen Khanna's uh, Che Dead. Mm -hmm. So uh, no, there are two or three things which, and I'm very interested in that. You said you use the word free fall of the Akbar nude, and both even in Juhu, there is a, the leg is got is going under. Now I would use a slightly different term. It's not a free fall. It's a break. It's like a. It's like a. She's been. She's tipped out of the frame, and I think it's as much about the frame as it is about the figure. And so this is this is where the formalist reading is interesting. That he's questioning the frame and he's allowing the figure, particularly in the one which is in your museum, <coughs> which is in the Kirinara Museum, the leg is out, has gone out. It is a break to the, it exceeds the frame. So I think that exceeding the frame is both formalist but also metaphorically, what does it do? And I think we could read that. In, so that was one part of your. I, mean, I was just saying that perhaps the choice of the word free fall, it is not a free fall, it's a very clumsy tipping over. And a free fall would be a, I mean, Taya painted the free fall of a falling figure. Yeah, yeah. But I think here it is some kind of a clumsy tipping over to emphasize the frame as much as the instability of the reclining figure, of the reclining node. And the second part, which is about light, <coughs> which I think is a different issue in a sense, but the fact that the lamp features as it does in several paintings and the light lamp held up. Um, I haven't thought of that iconography. I don't know whether there is some kind of a common iconographic uh, relay that is taking place within Indian, uh, amongst the Indian painters, or there is a more, uh, more, uh, well, a bigger allegorical meaning beyond the particular circumstances in which these paintings are. We could think about it. I'm not very sure, but it is. It is. It is quite interesting. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Gita. Uh, I. I was looking. I was looking at the uh, listening to the original frame that you set out uh, in what could perhaps be the first paragraph of um, attitudes of resistance, Ambedkar, the Dalit movements, etc. That you set out, and uh, <coughs> which you which you leave at that point. There isn't a sustaining argument, but can we then apply that to a reading of 
minoritarian positions. Sorry? Minoritarian positions. And I'm referring here particularly to the to the dark man of Hussein, which um, is, did, is quite deliberately ambiguous in your description. Uh, you don't use the words uh, particularly primitivism, but there is this, definitely this figure of resistance. But there is here, in a sense, can we see here an incipient position of the minoritarian point of view, perhaps both in Krishan Khanna, who uses um, the language of Christianity in a certain sense, which you again, as Annapurna said, you touch upon and then uh, you move away from that. But then the, the fact that he develops through uh, the entire Christ cycle of paintings, there is an embedded majority that he, there is a resistance to, through the minority position of here, the Christian minority speaking back in a certain sense. And Hussein, because he doesn't, uh, he doesn't perhaps couch his language quite specifically into these kinds of uh, terms, but creates a figure of resistance who is obviously um, the other as compared to a majoritarian position. I would be interested to know if you were thinking at all on those lines. I, uh, you're right that I headed my uh, talk with a paragraph that I didn't follow up. Those were the questions which are very large and are constantly having to be addressed as a subtext or, a, um, or a, as a as a uh, as a subtext or a main argument or as a polemic, and that exercise, uh, I three, I would have to do with a much longer theoretical uh, uh, exposition, as well as understanding of situations which I personally do not lay claim to. I know the signals, I know the markers, I know the. Uh, necessities and the critique of my kind of work or our kind of, many of our kind of work, but I'm not in a position, and I have said that often to my friends who are scholars of, uh, of either subaltern scholars or feminists or uh, feminist scholars or Dalit scholars, that I am not, I can listen, I can try to understand, I am not in a position yet to be able to I'm not in a position yet and may not be in a position to make a full um, argument from within art in relationship to these uh, motifs. So yes, I could, we could talk, I mean, I could take another stream, uh, another, uh, another uh, stream of thought or a stream of argument where what you raised could be the prime motif of what I'm saying. And um, certainly man can be read like that and Christians, chair not to my mind in that way, although within a larger allegorical body of work, yes. Um, and then we would have to take Souza very seriously within that. We'd have to take Ara and we'd have to take several artists in the more contemporary time. Uh, that argument I'd make somewhat more hesitantly and more discreetly with certain artists. Here I was doing what I might call an emblematic positioning. And I don't, yes you're right, I haven't dealt with that and would need another exposition, another kind for that. I rise every time to thank you, but if there, if there are any questions. <coughs> no, finally. <laughs> thank you very much. Kita. Thank you very much for all of you coming in such large numbers. Continue to come. <laughs> there are equally bright people who we keep on teaching. Thanks.